Namaste and Vanakkam. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, today is day nine. You know, like uh, time flies past because uh, we started it on May 23rd and now it is June 15. We are on the last day, day nine of the International Faculty Development Program today. And uh, we also keep uh, have been telling you about the um, set of list of things, you know, like yet to come. We had a yoga quiz uh, competition. We had an essay competition and a yoga sna competition also. So all these as part of the yoga mahotsav uh, to commemorate the International Day of Yoga 2023. And uh, we are so happy that this is the ninth uh, IDY that we are celebrating in a row without any break. Uh, even during the pandemic, it was like running and uh, we didn't take a break during uh, the pandemic also. So very, very happy to be welcoming you all again. We are just waiting due to some technical issue. The speaker, he's trying to join, but he's not able to join in. So uh, we'll get started and I'll ask uh, Ananda sir to share a few words after the prayer. So if we can all adjust, start the prayer. Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavava Hai Tejas Vinavadhita Mastu Mavidvishava Hai Om Shanti 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 Anakam, Mantanam and Swagatam, welcoming each and every one of you who have joined in for this International Faculty Development Program. Uh, I request uh, our director, Dr. Anand Balayogi Bhavanani, sir, to say a few words. Because today is the last day. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Meena. Uh, as you all know, this International Faculty Development Program, it was conceived in order to explore different dimensions of yoga therapy or yoga chikitsa. And we have had resource persons and participants from all over the world. I would say that being the ninth session today, a very beautiful completion of nine, that we have been able to go into new dimensions of yoga therapy that were not addressed earlier. Often we find in many of the conferences that the same slides, the same ideas are presented for years and years on end. And even the audience knows the slides of the presenter because they have seen it so many times. However, in this FDP, I take great pride that every presenter has worked on novel concepts, new initiatives, and made an effort to give a new perspective and dimensions. Because yoga chikitsa is the return to that sense of wholesomeness completeness of the human existence. Disease is a state of disconnection. And we are going back to that state of connectivity through Yoga Chikitsa. And I would like to say that today we are having two amazing speakers. Meena is going to give an official introduction. But on the first speaker will be Dr. Hemant Bhargav. And I always consider him a younger brother in both yoga and modern medicine because he did his medical training from the same university I did my medical training. And then he went on to train in yoga with his MD and going on to a PhD in yoga. And so I feel a very a beautiful sense of kinship with Dr. Heyman, who is a young researcher and already achieved a lot, but still 
he represents the youth and the future of yoga and yoga therapy in the scientific domain. And the second speaker is one who shows us the pinnacle, Dr. W. Selva Murthy, who has been there and done it, whatever you name. So we are going to have both the future and the past and the present all happening today. So I give over to Dr. Meena to give the proper introduction to Dr. Heyman, who's just uh, recovering from his jet lag of coming back from being in South America. I think he just got back yesterday. So welcome back to uh, India and looking forward to listening to you. Over to you, Dr. Meena. So once again, a very good morning to all of you. Um, and uh, let me share the screen. Is the screen visible now? Yes. So we are on day nine of uh, uh, the uh, International uh, Faculty Development Program on Yoga Therapy in Healthcare and Educational Settings. Um, like Sir was saying, Heman G, uh, Dr. Heman, he just got back from Brazil and uh, thank you so much, sir. We are very grateful to you that you joined in despite, you know, you being uh, with all the commitments. Uh, so that is something which we are very, very uh, privileged and honored to say that all the speakers, uh, you know, like very, very eminent speakers. We had uh, the list of, you know, eight day programs and you saw like 16 of them. And today we have two more lined up the, uh, you know, lecture sessions today, one by the first one by Dr. Hemant Bhargav and the next one by Dr. W. Selvamoti, sir, both stalwarts in their own field. Without much ado, let me introduce uh, Dr. Hemant Bhargav. He is the Assistant Professor of Integrative Medicine, Department of Integrative Medicine of Nimhans, Bengaluru. And apart from his medical studies, he has completed Diploma in Community Mental Health He's also done his MD in mental health and yoga rehabilitation and his PhD in yoga and spiritual, spirituality in mental health. He's a recipient of fellowship from the Welcome DB, DBT India, Alliance Early uh, Career Fellow. He has 108 scientific papers. You can see the index and uh, citations two books and 10 book chapters to his credit with his research interest in yoga, neuroscience, brain hemodynamics, uh, fMRI from the other, you know, interests. Um, working, he is currently working in two funded projects as uh, one as the primary investigator and one as a co-investigator. And he's completed two as the prim uh, primary investigator. Uh, investigator, all of them funded projects, uh, which is again, you know, as you all know, it is of great prestige. Um, he is a member of the Research and Academics Task Force of UGC, prophylactic uh, Ayush guidelines for children during COVID-19 uh, pandemic, Society for Neuroscience USA and others, just to mention a few. And he has been awarded a gold medal for both uh, the best MD as well as the best PhD thesis uh, and the promising youth uh, young faculty scholarship from USA. So over to you, Dr. Hemant, and uh, welcoming you uh, for the next half an hour, I mean 45 minutes. And then if there are questions, uh, the audience are most welcome to uh, put in your questions. So. Hemanji, all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meena. And uh, my namaste to Anand Balayogi Bhavnani, sir. My, you know, salutations to you. Uh, this has been a wonderful opportunity. Uh, you know, it is always nice to see, sir, you know, to interact with, uh, with him, to learn from him. Uh, as sir was saying, you know, we both come from the same university. Uh, we did MBBS from Nagpur. And uh, sir is like a role model to me. And, uh, and uh, so now with this, you know, I'll begin my presentation. So in this international faculty development program, you know, I would like to focus on the clinical aspects of yoga therapy, especially, you know, its role in healthcare. 
being a medical doctor who has been working in this field for almost 10 years now you know uh, i hope that i'll be able to share some insights and experience with you now you know this is the this is the the most fundamental graph you know we see it in uh, yeah, from our medical school we have been seeing it but the more i look at it the more relevant i find yoga you know, so there are domains of illness so, uh, so the the model you know that modern medicine teaches us is that you come into picture only when the person is ill you know but then when i came into the field of yoga i understood that that this is the last point you know where a doctor should enter uh, if you look at the ayurveda uh, text in sushruta samhita uh, there is um, a discussion you know there in those times also conferences used to happen so atreya maharshi used to conduct a conference and these you know ayurveda acharya from all over india would come so there was a discussion there where it was asked so what is the sign of a good physician you know how do you say that he is a good physician in the current times if you ask people would say that the longer the queue outside your opd the the better physician you are right but but atreya maharshi replies and says that a good physician in the in the periphery you know of 10 kilometers you know of a good physician in the whole village there should not be a single patient you know then he is a good physician it means that you are able to look at the nature around you are able to look at the environment you are able to suggest people the ritu charya the din charya you know all the thing and you are able to promote wellness so in this domains you know we see that the normal health is one aspect but then in the yogic sense when who adds the spiritual component to the definition of well being we say that we have to move towards positive health towards perfect health so the growth you know is uh, in yoga never stops and and what i realize now is that this whole field of yoga is about building resilience you know, the mental resilience the physical resilience and how does it work definitely you know there are evidences clinical evidences which are coming up in especially in the area of mental health care where we see that more and more uh, concrete evidences are emerging in several uh, mental health and non communicable disorders at the same time as we embark upon quality research in this field we also face some challenges the major challenge that we have been facing you know is to find an ideal placebo no for yoga because even if you do breath awareness even if you sit you are you know in some way trying to be mindful even mindfulness um, unfortunately in the western community has separated from yoga but it is a inherent part of yoga so um, these are some challenges blinding is another challenge you know whether you uh, people here in india of course will definitely know that they are doing yoga so you cannot blind the subject at the most you can do an assessor blinding and when you do this kind of adjustments then the challenge that comes is when you go to very high impact journals then it becomes difficult to publish so these are certain things related to this field but in spite of that if you look at the number of randomized controlled trials that are getting published in core clinical areas you know over the years there has been an exponential rise this is about yoga um, and in yoga therapy as well you know we see that there are increasing interest in in clinical areas so very quickly you know we'll just go to the history of yoga so, so um i am sure previous speaker would have gone into more details but because it also involves faculty development it is important to give a proper background so this first mention of the word yoga is in rigveda you know uh, it dates back to more than 5000 bc you know where there was first mention of the word yoga and in the vedic literature we see that yoga was uh, considered Uh, to be you know more uh, in, rooted in its philosophical approach the philosophical approach in the way that understanding the self developing better self awareness in that sense you know developing mastery over oneself that was the domain uh, and connecting it to the higher consciousness was the domain but then you know as yoga evolved from that 400 bc sage patanjali came up and he systematized yoga into eight limbs 
and then came this classical yoga after this classical yoga in the post classical period we saw that out of those eight limbs given by patanjali only the physical posture and the breathing techniques became popular and then hatha yoga was considered as a preparatory step to go into the advanced contemplative yoga of patanjali so these are the stalwarts who who you know took yoga to the west uh, swami vivekananda in 1893 you know he was the first one who took yoga to the west after that swami paramahansa yogananda uh, who you know uh, propagated the kriya yoga self realization fellowship then swami maharshi mahesh yogi he is popular for his transcendental meditation program then swami kuvalyananda you know the person with the specs he is considered as the earliest researcher of yoga he he put up a lab you know in 1920 uh, in kaivalya dhama institute in pune and started doing very systematic research he started a journal also in those years known as yoga mimamsa the yoga journal and of course we have we have shri bk s ayangar who popularized the modern understanding of yoga the asanas you know the the ayangar school is famous for the asana component so what we see is over the years you know yoga started as a very fundamental principle of living life in the right way from the vedas upanishads it came down now to the modern understanding where where most of the people understand yoga is another kind of a workout where you go as a to the dance class you go to gym like that you go to a yoga class and that is what yoga is you know so it is very important that people understand yoga in its correct perspective so so these two schools are common in the research also now patanjali uses the integrated approach of yoga whereas hat yoga focuses more on the physical and breathing aspects so what is yoga if you look at the understanding of yoga by sage patanjali he says yoga ha chitta vritti nirodha yoga is termination of the agitations of the mind now this chitta vritti you may have come across many kind of commentaries many kind of authors who talk about different understanding of this chitta vritti but you know if you go in detail uh, uh, throughout the patanjali yoga sutras it appears that these chitta vrittis are nothing but different modes of existence of the mind so the mind can can remain in a wakeful state mind can remain in a state of thought or mind can go into sleep you know in all these three states have been described as chitta vrittis by patanjali and he further says that chitta vrittis are klishta or aklishta it means that those vrittis can be beneficial for your spiritual growth or they can take you away from it so first thing we have to understand is that loosely we we try to um, collaborate collaborate this chitta with mind but but according to patanjali yoga sutra this chitta is more than just the mind this chitta is actually an interface between the consciousness that is the purusha that is uh, within the individual and also it is a mirror that reflects whatever the senses gather you know so so you you imagine a mirror you know this mirror can reflect whatever you show it to show to it and if this mirror is kept on the ground this mirror will start reflecting the sky it will start start reflecting the sun it will also show the trees it will also show the birds so on the same chitta there is reflection of the self which is the the supreme consciousness and on the same chitta there is reflection of the world around that we are gathering the information through our senses so the whole approach of this chitta vritti nirodha is to purify the chitta in such a way that it is able to reflect the sun within us completely so towards those approaches the state of wakefulness the state of thought or the state of sleep can contribute to it or or it can take you away from it say for example in a state of wakefulness i may you know in pramana sthiti so in the pratyaksha sthiti whatever information that i am getting through my senses i may you know uh, indulge in activities which involve sensual enjoyment if i do that 
my mirror is going to you know uh, get more colored whereas on the same way if i am able to direct my chitta towards you know certain kind of understanding that all these things that i am enjoying are ephemeral they have a nature of coming and going they will end so it will develop develop vairagya in me so in this way all the three modes thought processes or even sleep you know sleeping excessively can lead to you know a state where you cannot concentrate on the field of yoga or sleeping too less also is a problem so when the chitta vrittis you know are understood properly one is able to reach a state where one is neither in a state of indulgence in wakeful state nor identifying oneself with the thought process that is going on in the mind nor is one completely you know unaware that what happens when one goes into sleep so that kind of a state which you know in mandokya upanishad has been described as the turiya kind of a state where a person is wakeful but at the same time he is deeply rested and anchored within himself you know his his consciousness is not drawn completely out there is a part of consciousness which is rooted within the self that is a state of yoga that we are talking about and to achieve that state you know patanjali describes certain kind of behavioral you know uh, interventions asanas pranayama sense organ regulation and then the higher domains of meditation now i would like to bring your attention towards these yamas and niyamas they are very very you know beautiful principles of life yamas are the direction in which an individual would naturally you know spend his energy you know if one doesn't follow a yama his energy will be wasted wasted more and more if you if you do one violence it starts an unending chain of more and more violence because if you do violence the person will react you will react it continues you know so patanjali calls is that all these things which take us away from the yama they are known as vitarkas and they are the reason for ananta dukha and adnyana it leads to infinite chain of ignorance and pain so we use these yamas and niyamas in counseling our patients you know how do we do that we just ask the patients to understand which among these five yamas do you think in your life that you have been spending more energy is it your energy is getting spent towards non violence towards untruth towards you no know, stealing or excessive indulgence in senses or hoarding just become aware of that and niyamas are the direction in which you should channelize your energy so yamas are where you should not allow your energy to go niyamas are where you should allow your energy to move you know so the understanding is whenever a person deviates from these yamas he becomes prone towards mental illness so every mental illness is in a way manifestation of breaking one or the other yama for example if you say that a person suffers from depression which yama will a person break that he has to go through depression anyone from the audience there are five yamas here non violence truth non stealing brahmacharya i mean celibacy control over the sense organs and non holding not possessing things which i don't want what do you think among these five yamas which yama should a person break to get into depression any idea just i i want the students here the teachers here to apply a thought every mental illness is occurring because somewhere some yama has been broken what is the thought process that goes on in a depressed subject you know what we see is that the person is suicidal he wants to kill himself he has no interest in life so there is a component of violence but this violence is not directed towards others it is directed towards the self hmm? so the yama broken here is the yama of ahimsa the yama of non violence and 
and patanjali goes further and says that whenever you break any of these yamas they happen because fundamentally in our mind there are three impurities lobha moha and krodha greed infatuation attraction and anger so now you tell me if a, if a depressed subject is breaking the yama of ahimsa by becoming violent towards oneself behind this which impurity is there lobha moha or krodha anyone you can type in the chat box krodha yes yes so there is anger directed towards oneself anger directed towards oneself so from krodha there comes the vitarka badhana from vitarka badhana you break the yama of ahimsa and it continues and you become depressed this whole process of understanding the mind how you know the mental illness is developed by breakage of the yamas it has been called as pratipaksha bhavana hmm? if you read properly uh, in patanjali's uh, yoga sutra second chapter there has been this kind of a description which has which can be used as a counseling program yogic counseling pratipaksha bhavana becoming aware of yamas in one's own life in what way one is breaking those yamas and if one is breaking those yamas then understanding it comes from from which impurity lobha moha or krodha just this awareness this is a science of self awareness because self awareness is self empowering so in this way yoga from the very root of fundamental lifestyle principles of yamas and niyamas takes you towards asana pranayama and you start you know getting into the, those moments of stillness calmness into various kind of sampradnyata samadhis that is the mental resilience that we are talking about that is the understanding of yogi as yoga as a lifestyle we are talking about you know so very important to understand yoga as a lifestyle and not as physical posture this is my first message you know to the crowd here so you know we we spoke about different levels of health and how wonderfully this sage in 400 bc is able to cover all the domains of health health in his eight limbed approach you know what 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 remains there is no better scientific text that i have ever read than patanjali yoga sutra on psychology everything is so methodical you know any any place you you do not find a single word being used extra you know the sequence of the words also matters so i would like you know all the students who are here all the faculties who are here to you know read this text very seriously so now you know from these eight limbs given by patanjali various schools of yoga have emerged some schools use one component some school use permutation and combination of these components some school use them all and the research if you look at it then we see that predominantly the scientific mechanisms that are emerging are that yoga has definite effects on human physiology especially the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis where it down regulates and reduces your cortisol so yogic mechanism so far you know have been two fold one is a top down approach other is the bottom up approach the top down mechanism predominantly looks like that yoga enhances the central gabargic tone gaba is the neurotransmitter which brings calmness into the system it reduces anxiety so that happens through the central mechanisms and the bottom up approach of yoga is mainly by increasing vagal tone no vagus nerve is spread throughout the body and you flap your abdomen or you do all these yogic pranayamas everywhere there is a there is a branch of vagus which gets stimulated and then connects to cns and brings a state of parasympathetic dominance these are two fundamental ways in which yoga affects the biology which translates into all these clinical improvements so we look at patanjali's approach you know yamas and niyamas bodily postures breath regulation sense organ you know regulation focusing defocusing the mind all the approaches are fundamentally directed towards reducing the agitations of the mind second you know important message that i want to give here is the 
the this is the horizontal understanding of yoga but you go in depth you know then this particular text called as taittiriya upanishad provides five layer model of human existence the beauty of this model is that the root of existence has been described as bliss you know so the clear message from yoga is that the bliss that you are searching in your life the peace that you are searching in your life its reservoir its source is within you you will find your peace your satisfaction your happiness bliss within you so the very core of existence of not only human being the core of the whole existence has been described as ananda you know we get a lot of patients who have you know this kind of uh, 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 somatoform pain disorders or or the patients who have emotionally unstable personality disorders these are the patient who cannot enjoy you know they they feel that they can't enjoy anything in life they don't find joy in anything so this kind of a model really helps because the the direction in which the person starts searching the peace changes the core is the 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 core of my existence is bliss i have to look for it within me now in this five layered model there is this third layer which is known as the layer of emotions it is called as the manomaya kosh the yogic texts say that any illness that manifests on human body it has only two causes you know in our medical school you know if we look at any medical illness and we look at the etiology most of the time they are idiopathic especially non communicable disorders idiopathic means we don't know or there are so many factors you know that that contribute to them but yoga vashishtha guru of rama answers this question about human disease in a very very simple and lucid way he says any disease on human body has two causes one external or if you cannot find out any pinpoint external cause automatically assume that the cause is internal apart from this there are no other causes look at any disease fine so the disease is due to external cause like you have poisoning you have infections you have accidents you have injuries all of them snake bite all of them will go in one category they are called as anadhija vyadis okay these diseases which come from outside we have found that they can also be managed by the agents from outside you know there are antibiotics for bacteria there are antidotes for poisons modern medicine does wonder in cases of accidents and injuries yes so we did external engineering we conquered all the five basic elements air water earth fire space through science and technology and engineering and with that we are able to manage the problems that arise from outside yes so so there is nothing like modern medicine in this scenario but then there is other category of illness where you cannot find a pinpoint cause of that disease in the environment essential hypertension can you tell me that this is the agent in environment that gave you hypertension diabetes asthma migraine headaches epilepsy various kind of cancers coronary artery disease are these not the major burning issues that we are facing no. but where is the problem now the external science and technology and engineering what we used for managing the disorders coming from outside you know in non communicable disorder modern medicine won several diseases were eliminated you know completely but the the error happened is modern medicine started using the same approach in treating the disorders which do not have an external cause also so when a disease has external cause external agents work when a disease does not have external cause and you start applying the same external treatments for a disease due to an internal cause they never cure it so for all these diseases the cure word has been eliminated from modern medicine they use only control and this control also is just you know very superficial it does not actually control the medicine itself damage different organs so 
what is the yogic understanding here when you say that the cause is not external the cause is internal it is understood that the cause is in the layer of prana the layer of life force or it is in the layer of emotions so yoga is very clear about it all these ncds where there is no external cause they are arising from deep rooted unresolved emotional conflicts there is no other reason definitely environmental factors your lifestyle plays a role but basically you know our inability to manage and understand our emotions our mind is the root cause so what yoga does is it uses these eight limbs yama niyama asana pranayama meditation pratyahara all these limbs to bring an harmony into these three layers the annamaya kosha the pranamaya kosha and the manomaya kosha when they come in harmony then the deeper layer the layer of insight and the layer of bliss can start manifesting on the body and when they start manifesting you know when a person starts turning inwards this harmony can you know not only enhance your resilience but can also reverse these non communicable disorders patanjali was very clear patanjali says pratyak chetanaadi gamo antaraya abhavas if you are able to turn your consciousness inwards the antarayas you can overcome and which is the first antaraya the first antaraya is vyadhi so patanjali is telling clearly that if you are able to turn your consciousness inwards and resolve these deep rooted emotional conflicts you can overcome vyadhis so you can cure you can reverse all you can reverse hypertension you can reverse hypothyroidism you can reverse heart diseases this we have seen miracles happening you know with yoga but it requires correct understanding of yoga the abhyasa that you have to do has to be dirgha kal nairantarya satkara sevito drud bhumi so you, you should follow properly you are doing yoga once in a week and you say yeah nothing happened it doesn't work like that yoga is not a science to be done once a week twice a week yoga is a lifestyle to be kept in your heart every moment of your life okay. then it will do wonders it 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 uh, actually can do so now we come towards you know the understanding from from where all these kind of um, you know philosophies come and how as a therapy it works from the veda we see atharva veda gives us ayurveda rigveda and upanishads give us the yoga philosophy fundamental approach you know this i want all the yoga therapists to keep this in mind you know that these are the five basic elements which form the external environment there is nothing else and the same five basic elements form this body not only the body all the five layers that you see the annamaya pranamaya manomaya vidnyana ananda everything is subtler and subtler manifestation of these five elements because they still come under the purview of prakriti so prakriti can be gross it can be sukshma so sthula prakriti and sukshma prakriti so first keep get this model clear in your mind there are five layers each layer has five elements and they are going from gross to subtle and what is our job our job is to bring a harmony in the forces of these five basic elements so air and space combine to form vata in the body rajas in the mind water and earth form kapha in the body tamas in the mind and fire and water form pitta which is in the form of a light in the mind in the form of a sattva so so the whole approach of this traditional systems is to bring a beautiful harmony and balance in these kind of systems so here this is also the model of integrative medicine because the five basic elements nothing escapes modern medicine also deals with five basic elements you know so you know the talk that has been going on in nimas now is that you use modern medicine also with a traditional view point so you have an acute flare up of multiple sclerosis and you are giving them cortisol you say that i am giving cortisol for pitta shamana because pitta is inflammation so it is used as a shamana aushadi in, in ayurveda there is a shamana aushadi and there is a shodhana aushadi so it is superficial symptomatic management but it is to pacify a dosha but after that it will give you an insight that after that you have to clean the pitta by doing virechana so you will not stop there 
so what we see is that all these systems together can adopt this kind of a viewpoint and it can bring, it can give you the direction so the the ayurveda that i will use is also for pitta shamana and then i can also use yogic practices for pitta shamana if you look at hatha yoga pradipika it describes it says that the sitali pranayama reduces pitta hmm? kapha dosha for that uh, kapala bhati has been described as kapha dosha vishoshani bhastrika is a tridosha shamaka so i see that yoga therapy and its growth in future you know will happen if now we as yoga therapists no enough of this symptom sim- sympathetic parasympathetic okay it is up to understanding we cannot keep on doing same forever mm-hmm. now we have to move further in our science so the next point now is that you look at tri doshas please all yoga therapists get knowledge of tri dosha this is very very fundamental to life very very fundamental to life and this way you will see that if you are able to give yoga therapy to balance the doshas in synchrony with ayurveda ritucharya dincharya principles we will grow so this is the basic understanding the basic message that i wanted to give you in terms of yoga in healthcare you know some insights one principle is that yoga is not only asana it is a lifestyle second is that you have to look at yoga therapy in the panchakosha perspective bringing a harmony into the layers the last two layers are perfect the initial three layer need balance and this balance has to happen when you look at each layer sub classified into the harmony of the five basic elements now five basic elements in the body five basic elements in the prana the five basic element in the emotions i just want to have some more discussion here you know i don't want to you know give lot of information to you and at the end you will not even realize what did you learn right? i want to be very clear so now you know there are students here there are faculties here we can discuss for some time you know these five basic elements in the body you know can you feel them how do you think in the physiology of the body these five basic elements are functioning hmm? so can anybody give me an, any insight about arrangement or or functioning of these five elements in the body in our physiology uh, if you want you can type it in the chat box or if you want to say it you just raise your hand i will unmute you for participants yes, yes. or i will just simplify my question see the the say say there is an element which is fire you know where is this fire in the body can anybody tell me looking at very intelligent no this science is very intelligent you have to look at the property of the fire and then see those properties in your body so what are the properties of fire so we are starting to have some answers in the chat box okay 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 digestive fire very good very good so number one thing number one thing that we see here is heat divya has typed here heat so number one thing fire does it that it generates heat we can feel heat in our stomach there is something known as jatharagni there is fire then somebody has very beautifully typed eyes so fire apart from giving heat fire also gives one more thing fire throws light fire removes darkness so you can see the glow in the eyes the eyes is the organ which perceives light so the eye is the organ for fire so yoga philosophy has three fires hmm? it is known as jatharagni then the second fire which we call it as darshanagni and the third fire is known as the gnanagni hmm? gnanagni dagdh karmanam tamahu panditam budha and all three agnis are connected so your digestion is connected to your perception your perception is connected to your cognition so therefore you want to improve cognition and you are not working on improving digestive fire it won't work so kapalbhati improves cognition everybody knows but nobody tells that kapalbhati improves cognition because it improves jatharagni 
so in this way you know a different view point of yoga therapy that we have to look at it panch mahabhuta concept hmm? then where is water in the body also you know very interestingly i would say as a human being we weigh 70 kg you know out of this 70 kg if you want to distribute percent wise you know how much kg goes to which element hmm? can anybody can anybody tell me how much kg goes to which five element you are now a 70 kg person how much percent of it goes to which element say you have a 100 kg man how much how much kg water he has someone has type 75% yeah 70% is water 70 70 kg you you are water 70 kg hmm? are you aware of that and this water is exactly the same kind of water which is there in the ocean now this water is the ocean water is very sensitive to moon hmm? you see the full moon the waves go up the moon comes down but in this body you know you exist are you aware that something happens with the phases of the moon to your body no if you are really a yogi you get up in the morning and you will know that today is ekadashi the, the radiations of the of the moon on your body 70% is water hmm? rest rest 30% is earth so 100 kg 100% is of these two element only because these two element only have mass the fire air and space they are so subtle hmm? so another property of this is that both earth and water go down with gravity which is the element that that can defy gravity fire fire is the only element that defies gravity vayu is everywhere but if you have to go against gravity if you have to go up it is only fire that goes so in the in the pranamaya kosha there is udana prana it goes upward this is the fire prana now you have vomiting belching all this is happening because there is a prana a vata that can take you against gravity and then the downward moving prana the apana prana you no know, urination defecation micturation menstruation all these thing are happening with gravity downwards so they are the manifestation of earth and water together so you have to bring about a balance you have to bring about a balance between the fire water and earth so a lady has menstrual irregularities her her menses are irregular it means what is happening her apana the downward moving prana is not flowing properly so what you have to do you have to activate that you know so how you you have to activate this downward moving prana is you have to give the yoga practices of butterfly you have to give pavan mukta asana so that the downward moving prana you know the 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 those elements increase similarly when you you know um, you know that when you get intensely angry the head becomes very heavy you feel intense anger your head becomes heavy you get headache so the upward moving prana anger is connected to fire whenever a person becomes angry he wants to burn everything he doesn't say that i want to pour water on everything he says i will burn krodha is also a agni agni goes up therefore krodha hits the head therefore you feel heaviness in the head because the udana prana increases by anger so you want to uh, re reduce migraine so you have to see that excessive prana is moving in the head so i have to move it down or you have to see where the excessive so where the prana is life energy it will go in the direction according to these five basic elements then you come to emotions you know is are there these five elements in our emotions as well can you tell me as, as i said krodha krodha is agni tell me which which uh, emotion will you put for water which emo emotion will you put for earth which emotion will you put for air
so earth actually means uh, people are putting fear for water earth insecure water calmness moha yes so water is a flowing emotion no you you feel a flow compassion love connectivity so there is a flow of emotion earth when you actually you know have that kind of feeling you know that you are very grounded or it can both can be klishta and aklishta patanjali is very clear so in every way you can interpret it that it can lead to your spiritual growth or so it can also give you that depression that you do not want to do anything not want to engage in anything you lie down like a stone that emotion of heaviness also is earth you know so so dear friends just giving you a perspective you know that how we can start this journey and how we can now make our yoga therapy more methodological more systematic uh, in our approach so balancing the prana balancing the emotion and then of course using the diet you know the diet also has this pancha mahabhutas only the, the pancha rasas are there the sweet has earth and what spicy has has fire and water pitta increases the astringent has has a air element in it you know so like that there are five tastes of your food that will also tell you what you have to eat so that you bring a harmony into this punch kosha model so this is what you know um, i wanted to discuss with you that the message of yoga therapy is to bring a harmony into this system and bring a balance so this is the uh, the approach that i think that yoga should take in its health care namaste thank you so much dr hemant uh, that was a truly uh, tejas presentation illuminating presentation uh, in a very uh, you know harmonious balanced manner and uh, i think this is the type of direction we need to take and in our own yoga chikitsa training the gita and the tradition we look at the doshas we look at the gunas we look at the mahabhutas we look at the prana because as my father would say modern yoga therapy is western physiotherapy with indian clothes on and uh, he used to say that 30 years ago what would he say today and yes. so as you have rightly pointed out we need to go back to the roots of what yoga is what yoga chikitsa is and for those of you who are fortunate to come to see us tomorrow day after the day after we have dr heman visiting us in person to deliver a talk at our conference here and also it is uh, our privilege that uh, dr heman has uh, accepted our offer to be an adjunct faculty at the iscm school of yoga therapy we are awaiting the official letters to move because we have had a change in vice chancellor but uh, such a pleasure to listen to you dr heman and i'm so happy to hear this type of perspective from a medical doctor because we hear it from yoga charyas often but we don't hear it from medical doctors and i think it is important that the medical doctors in yoga therapy don't become you know just uh, you know reductionists again because the reductionist approach is so popular and i'm so happy the integrative medicine uh, department at infants has you there with very eminent personalities and i'm sure that we can expect a lot of good things to come out from you looking forward to seeing you here day after tomorrow uh, get over your jet lag and come here thank you thank you sir thank you for this opportunity sir and meena madam we would now go over to our second speaker dr selvamurthy sir has joined us and uh, for those of you who have been from day one with us on this fbb you know that uh, selvamurthy sir was with us for the inaugural session also and graced and blessed us and he is here for the final session also so one full complete cycle <laughs> has been completed with the sir's blessing i request dr meena to give the official introduction to sir and then we hand over the space to sir as you all know he has been a mentor for me in my life 
And uh, this is why uh, today is a combination of Dr. Hemant and mm -hmm. on one side and Dr. Selvamurthy on the other. I, I feel sandwiched between the past and the <laughs> future. <laughs> Though all of us are in the present also, it is so beautiful. So over to you, Dr. Meena, for the official introduction. Thank you, Dr. Ananda. Good morning. Namaste. Namaste, sir. So before introducing Selvamurthy, sir, I would just like to congratulate uh, Hemant ji uh, for that wonderful and uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, session that you just gave. Uh, because I think in the chat box, this is the uh, you know presentation where we had maximum interaction from the participants. So congratulations on that for keeping them all active and uh, not sleeping. Huh? So wonderful, sir. We are looking forward to having you here. Uh, Selva Murthy, sir, namaste and vanakkam, welcoming you. Uh, we are so honored and privileged to have you here as part of our international uh, faculty development program, sir. It gives me so much of pleasure to be uh, reading this introduction, giving this introduction to him. So excellent to have you, sir. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much, Meena. So, Selva Murthy, sir, the president of Amity Science, Technology and the Innovative Foundation, ASTIF, the director general of Amity Directorate and Science and Innovation, and the chancellor of Amity University, Chhattisgarh. Uh, sir has served in defense research and development organization, what is very famously known as uh, DRDO, yes. the government of India for 40 years, and his research has impacted many nationally and internationally benefiting the society at large. He is the chairman of many prestigious national committees. The committee is really uh, honored to have him there as part of it. And uh, more than 300 and, uh, 250 research papers and uh, 18 books to his credit, Sir has represented India in numerous councils and organizations. And uh, in recognition of his significant contribution to biomedical research and development, he has been awarded a number of prestigious research awards, including the CSIR's National Award for ST Invitation. Uh, innovations, uh, academic uh, Merced Mirakimov, I hope I got it right, award for a contribution to high altitude medicine, uh, technology leadership award by DRDO, lifetime achievement award, and uh, uh, he has uh, got it from the hands of the president of India then, and many more to his credit. This is just a representative sample that I have given because uh, going through the whole of the biodata will be more than an hour and uh, we will not be able to hear him. So over to you, uh, Selva Murthy, sir. Uh, looking forward to hearing you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Meena. Oh, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. What a great pleasure to be a part of this great mission, which Dr. Ananda Baliyogi, as well as Meena, and the Balaji Vityapit is now undertaking to propagate the message of yoga, particularly the yoga therapeutic potentials of yoga. So this is a curtain raiser for the International Day of Yoga 2023. And Dr. Ananda has been uh, very, very, very uh, meticulously organizing this event every year. And this year also he has done it in a meticulous way to organize an international FDP uh, just before the International Day of Yoga. And these are the endeavors which will put yoga on a scientific pedestal and also convey the blessings and message of yoga across the globe. So I must compliment Dr. Uh, Yogacharya, Dr. Ananda, whom I have seen growing from his childhood as a boy, small young boy. I have seen him 
Gitananda Yoga Ashram. And uh, his father is uh, like my guru in yoga. I have visited several times the Gitananda Ashram. And also uh, Bhavani Ji, I, I have great respects for these stalwarts who are propagating yoga, not only at the national level, but at the global level. So again, I pray God to bless you with good health, enthusiasm, zeal to continue this mission of propagating yoga across the globe. I must also compliment all those faculties and the distinguished participants of this FTP program, International FTP program. You have been through all through this almost 15 days, right from the beginning, the inaugural I was there. So I, now I am the last one to speak as well. So uh, I thought I should share with you some of my own experiences in yoga research, which I have done when I have been part of the DRU and also now in Amity University for the last one decade. So four decades in DRU, I have been propagating yoga through physiological, biochemical, psychological, clinical research, a series of research, which I have done taking yoga to high altitude, yoga to the Arctic, and yoga to the bedside in the military hospitals. So now yoga is introduced in the armed forces. That's a great uh, news, as well as achievements of four decades of our endeavor in DRU to put yoga on a scientific pedestal for a common man like a soldier, how he can benefit so that we can all benefit. It's only a, he is in uniform, we are not in uniform. That's all the difference. The physiology, psychology is almost the same. So I will be sharing some of my results, findings, the salient aspects on the prophylactic, promotive and curative potentials of yoga on a, the scientific perspectives, which I have been able to do during the last about five decades. So let me share my screen. Can you see the slides? Yes, yes. sir. But not full screen yet. Yes. Now Is it OK see. now? Yes, sir. That is it. So I'm going to talk about how yoga can be beneficial for positive health. Why should we only look at therapy? We shouldn't allow a person to get into disease at all. So I would look right from that angle because a large country like ours are 7 billion people in the globe. We must focus on the prophylactic aspects of health rather than curative aspects. So I would be touching the prophylactic as well as promotive. How do you bring the best out of an individual? That is also health. It's just not only being healthy, but productive, constructive, creative, innovative, kundalini shakti, awakening. All this is necessary. So there is a promotive aspect of health. Finally, the curative aspects of health. So I would be touching up all these three dimensions in my presentation. So once again, my compliments to our School of Yoga Therapy Institute of Salutogenesis, Complementary Medicine of uh, Sri Balaji Vidya Peet. And we have an MOU with this organization, with your university. <clears throat> so I would consider this, this also as part of one of the collaborative endeavors in which my presence is here. And uh, also our support will always be there with you. But also the Moranj Desai National Institute of Yoga, who has co-sponsored from Ministry of Ayush, this whole FTP program. So compliments to you. Uh, Dr. Ananda, Dr. Meena, please continue this mission, which you have taken, life mission, which you have taken up for promoting yoga for the benefit of the man, humankind. Now, when I, when I look at a large country like ours with 1.4 billion people, the, there are many health challenges. You know, the first is diverse demographic population. Now, there are people in, uh, we have one side the demographic advantage of youth and also the other geriatric population growing. So there is a difference there. And also the disease patterns, the, we were worried more about the communicable diseases some time back. But today the country is worried about non-communicable diseases as well. 
So the double burden of communicable and non-communicable disease. There is an inequity uh, in terms of healthcare delivery. If you look at the people, 70% of the doctors are here in the urban setup, but 70% of the population is live in rural areas. So there is a disparity between <clears throat> the healthcare requirement and its delivery. So it's another challenge. So why I'm bringing all this dimension is, how do we use our traditional knowledge, traditional system of medicine, including yoga, that uh, to in the healthcare delivery? So that is why I'm bringing these challenges a country like ours. Similarly, the technology deployment, when you go to rural areas, primary health centers, district hospitals, you may not have all that what you have in referral hospitals and urban setup and cities. So there's another challenge. And people's awareness about uh, the public health hygiene is very, very low. That's another challenge. Unsafe drinking water, undernutrition. There are many, many cumulative challenges for a large country with 1.4 billion people. And if we have to keep them as an asset, we, this is this triangle of education, occupation, healthcare. That is the triangle which is important, in which healthcare plays a pivotal role. Without a good health, you cannot acquire good education. You cannot be productive in your occupation. So that is why if this 1.4 billion people have to be transformed as an asset, valuable asset to the nation, the focus is on education, occupation, healthcare, with healthcare playing a pivotal role. And this healthcare delivery, I have already mentioned the challenges to provide the healthcare delivery. And just one minute, I will attend this important card. What's your Money. Yes, yes, yes. I, I'll call you. I'm giving a presentation. I'll just call you. Huh? Yes. Uh, so the Ayush system of holistic, holistic system of healthcare delivery is the one which can give this kind of uh, the, uh, the positive health to 1.4 billion people where Ayurveda, yoga, Siddha, Yunani and homeopathy is going to play a very, very significant role in which yoga perhaps has the, all the three dimensions which I mentioned, the prophylactic, promotive and curative aspects. Now, let me start with the Prime Minister's, uh, our Honorable Prime Minister, Sri Narendra Modi, uh, this address in UN General Assembly on September 27th in 2014. And this is what brought in a transformation of yoga becoming global in a formal way. Otherwise, yoga has been uh, the propagated globally, but this is a situation in which uh, the uh, Honorable Prime Minister took it in a formal way to the United Nations, Today, the, uh, on 21st June, the whole globe is celebrating International Day of Yoga to propagate this knowledge of yoga across the humanity. Let me quote, yoga is, is an invaluable gift of India's ancient tradition. This tradition is 5,000 years old. It embodies unity of mind, body, thought and action, restraint and fulfillment. Harmony between man and nature, your holistic approach to health and well-being. It's not about exercise, but to discover the sense of oneness with yourself, the world and the nature. By changing of lifestyle and creating consciousness, it can help in well-being. Let us work towards adopting an international yoga day. So this was a game changer in terms of taking yoga to the global level. So our salutations to Honorable Prime Minister for this great, the gift which he has given to the whole world. And when you talk about yoga, this is mentioned 5,000 years ago. So it is not just a new science or new philosophy, 
that it is it has been there in our generations traditions culture over thousands of years so being mentioned in vedas upanishad bhagavad gita so this yoga has that kind of long tradition and yoga the word yoga means to yoke unite and combine bring a union between self and the universe or body and mind jivatma and paramatma so the unification yoking means to unification so that is the meaning of yoga so this this is the long tradition founded in india if india has given something to the world i think i would put yoga as the first one which we have given to the whole world now yoga practice is just not only for well being you know the physical well being or mental well being spiritual well being and also elevation of your consciousness higher level of consciousness or moksha that is the ultimate maintaining a good health is the first step so the next step is to go into spiritual awakening and then ultimately lead to uh, elevation of your consciousness and reaching to moksha ultimate salvation so that is the uh, purpose of yoga and yoga for therapy is one aspect one aspect but yoga is actually for a much higher objective or a goal of having moksha we have different sects of yoga like karma yoga bhakti yoga jnana yoga hatha yoga kundalini yoga raja yoga so ultimately the whole objective is to reach that unification of self with the universal self and so i enjoy this quoting we are not human beings having a spiritual experience we are actually spiritual being having a human experience just think for a being for a minute that we are not the human being looking for spiritual experience through yoga we are actually spiritual being so through yoga we want to realize our true existence so this is how i would like to see we are all atma living in this body on a with a particular role so that if that uh, awakening comes realization comes and then you have all your problems are no no disease and you will lead a healthy and happy life so this is what is the purpose of yoga to make give that realization to each and every one of the practitioners this has already been discussed uh, our friend just i was listening to dr hemant bargava so and many of us many of the teachers might have spoken so i don't want to mention about this but all that i want to say is there has to be a harmony between all this five layers of existence yog means to have the harmony between anamaya kosha pranamaya kosha manomaya kosha vijnanamaya kosha anandamaya kosha the stability will come only when you have equilibrium among all these layers similarly many of you might have already spoken about chakras but what i want to emphasize in this slide is you should also understand we are a body of energy with a matter so just think that the human existence is energy it is a bio energy spiritual energy in in the form of a matter so that realization should come so there is a flow of energy whenever there is a kink or block or over excitation or under uh, the utilization of energy energy block or energy flow then it can lead to ill health and disease so now i am going to talk about uh, the three aspects the prophylactic promotive and curative potentials of yoga the scientific aspects you name any disease you can attribute to any one of the five factors which i have put in this slide the lack of exercise because our body is actually evolved if you look at the evolution we were living in jungles mountains caves facing the facing the vagaries of the climate running away from predatory animals hunting for the food so the body was evolved to be that type of toughness but with sedentary living modern living it undergoes disuse atrophy leading to many diseases arthritis musculoskeletal disorders low back pain cervical and hyper hypertension diabetes all this is some way related to lack of exercise one disease causing factor the second disease causing factor is dichotomy between mind and body mind does something body does something else like for example we all had breakfast 
and because in india it is the breakfast time in the morning so how many of us really focused on the eating process either we were looking at the mobile and then putting the food inside so mind is in the mobile and body is in the process of eating so there's a dichotomy between mind and body which can cause disease because once you look at the food the flavor texture color the saliva is secreted peristaltic movement starts and digestive juices are poured in so all this will happen in a in a way when you are in the process harmonious with the eating process if it doesn't then it can lead to hyperacidity because the saliva which is relatively alkaline has to go and neutralize the acid which is secreted by the presence of food so this dichotomy can cause disease i gave one simple mundane example but in our life many things happens of this type of disharmony between mind and body which can cause disease the third is stress stress everyone encounters stress of some kind or other so stress can be an etiological factor causative factor it can be an aggravating factor or it can be a precipitating factor so this stress is very important causative factor for a disease pollution the air pollution water pollution soil pollution all this can cause disease as well so the fifth factor is infection the all that micro pathogens which is there virus bacteria fungus and all that toxins so it can cause disease yoga is prophylactic against all these five factors and we have evidences to show that the first is yoga is a total exercise taking care of the first factor physical physiological psychological exercise including massaging some internal organs like navli kriya when you do the ones which you don't get exercise even in physical exercise get exercise it's a is a removal of the toxins because when you do kriya it remove the toxins from the body so takes care of the whole exercise if you take it as an exercise so that that is the first factor is taken care of the second is in yoga even if you make a small movements like this you are instructed to be conscious of the movement so if i am drinking a glass of water i am enjoying that water going through the esophagus getting down so the mind is involved in that physical process so that is why it brings a harmony so it is not yoga is not just one hour half an hour you do exercise or asanas yoga has to be a way of life so that brings a harmony between mind and body so if i am giving a lecture my mind has to be totally focused and involved in that that is yoga so this is how the harmony between mind and body comes in you as a way of life rather than only during the asanas or uh, the yogic practice this is taking care of the second factor third factor is stress Uh, stress management is very simple you know there's three steps normalize your perception optimize your reaction release the stress as quickly as possible this is all stress management so yoga helps you to normalize your perception of life the philosophy of life because everyone comes with vasanas of janmas of birth rebirth we have come everyone is unique and so that realization comes in and then in karma we are coming with a karmic account so whatever we get in this janma is dependent on what we have done earlier with a karmic account so this realization comes in so the perception of your life philosophy itself changes so thereby normalizing the perception of the stress if you don't perceive anything as stressful you don't have to worry about the stress causing the stress related disorders so normalizes perception optimizes your reaction i'll show some examples how does it build the parasympathetic tone and also how does it bring the tranquility even in adverse situation so we have done experiments to show that so it optimizes your reaction to stress you don't spike and ex- show exaggerated arousal to stress but you have an optimal arousal to stress then it also releases the stress quickly as possible so the excitation which has gone up and it comes back as quickly as possible to equilibrium state so it releases the stress so this is how yogic practice helps in stress management the fourth is pollution so yoga strengthens all your inherent the detoxification processes like liver kidney spleen reticular endothelial system cilia all this are strengthened activated 
thereby taking care of the pollution to a very large extent. Then the infection, you have cell uh, the cell mediated immunity, humoral immunity. So both are strengthened by practice of yoga. So this is how yoga is prophylactic. So it prevents diseases, leaving away the genetically transmitted diseases. Even there, the expression of those genes can be modulated by practice of yoga. So yoga is prophylactic. Yoga is promotive because you have to bring physical potentials in you, psychological potentials, cognitive potentials, the kundalini awakening, all these are very important. So it is not to be just only I have no disease, I'm healthy, no, you have to be best of your potentials. That is a good health. So yoga brings all your the potentials to surface and thereby the promotive aspects are manifested, whether it is uh, uh, the suppleness of the body or physical efficiency at uh, submaximal or maximal level of exercise, or it is the psychomotor functions, or it is cognitive functions. All these are improved. I'll show some data a little later, but yoga is promotive as well. We have done it in our controlled experiments on soldiers. Then yoga is also curative. Yoga can be an adjunct therapy. Yoga can also be in certain lifestyle intervention. It can form a very important component of the medical management. And also it can particularly in psychosomatic disorders and stress-related disorders, lifestyle disorders. Yoga has been very well demonstrated to be very beneficial with its cur tremendous curative potentials. And there are many, when you open the literature, there are many, many clinical conditions in which Yoga, I have picked up some of them to show that yoga is beneficial as a curative aspect of health as well. Now, when you look at some of the challenges the 21st century man or woman faces today, it's an expanded work area. Now, people working from home, it's almost 24 hours work. So you don't have... Uh, like earlier, eight hours work or 10 hours work, then come home and spend the rest of the time. So here, it is totally an expanded work. The whole day is work, multi-job, multitasking. You know, some, if you are at home, you have to stay at home also, you have to see work also. So it's a multi multitasking you need to do in this present scenario. The long working hours naturally, and then also nuclear family. So we all, you, we lived in, a joint family system. But now that is breaking away. The buffer system which you had for some of the psychological uh, challenges, stress and others were taken care of in a joint family system. But with the nuclear family, the health challenges are increasing as well. So these are some of the challenges in 21st century related to health. The COVID-19 brought another dimension. You know, it's uh, uh, then we, uh, we also have literature we have studies carried out by Muraj Desai National Institute of Yoga and many, many laboratories in COVID that those who practiced yoga, including me, you know, I also was affected, I was affected uh, in the wave, second wave of COVID, but then I could manage at home. I couldn't, uh, you know, because I have been practicing yoga for 45 years. I have been practicing yoga. So I have never been admitted to hospital in my 74 years. Now I am 74. And I still climb stairs, I don't use lift. All this is because of yoga. So I have not only experimented on yoga, but I have experienced whatever I am today, if I have achieved all that Meena was talking about as my profile, yoga has contributed immensely to this. So I have not only experimental learning on yoga, but experiential learning on yoga, having practiced it for 45 years. So those who practice COVID, uh, yoga during the COVID, their relax, their recovery as well as the uh, even when they are convalescing and also coming out of it, the recovery was also much faster. And there are evidences to show that. So these are some of them: uh, the common yoga protocol, as well as the asanas which are used for practicing. Uh, these are some of them very popular among the people: pranayam, shavasan and also uh, Trikona asana. These are some of the asanas which were found to be beneficial for the COVID patients. Now, coming to our experiments on soldiers, I have done a series of experiments in the DRDO. 
and uh, the prophylactic, promotive, and curative aspects, in which these are the some of the asanas. So we had one hour practice of yoga, which included uh, the uh, 45 minutes of asan, then about uh, 10 minutes of uh, the pranayam, and five minutes of about uh, the, the meditation. So the whole focus was on the asanas in our series of experiments, being on soldiers. So we were looking at if yoga was taught to a soldier in the battlefield, you know, Bhagavad Gita, the yoga was taught to, uh, by, to Arjun, who is a warrior. So can also our soldiers who have to operate in extremes of environments like high altitude, cold, desert, underwater, aerospace, low intensity conflict situation. So such a human being who are exposed to those extremes of vagaries of climatic as well as operational conditions, can yoga also help that individual? So we looked at from that angle, but then you can extrapolate all that what you see here to a common man who is not a soldier, but then who also faces different type of vagaries of in life, vagaries in life. So that is, but in our experiments, many variables can be controlled, which is difficult to be controlled in a civilian study. One is I can have an age group between 20 to 30 years, means only that age group will come. They have to be on 3,500 uh, kilocalories every day diet, they will be on that diet. They have to do asan from 6 to 7 a.m., they will do it religiously. So many variables which you may not be able to control in a civilian population. I had the advantage of controlling those variables which interfere with your physiological and psychological responses where, it, where controlled in our experiments. So then some of the, just the facilities which I used during that time at the Defense Institute of Physiology and Allied Sciences, which I have shown some of them here. So we used many, many more functional MRIs and others as well. So then I'll just give a glimpse. I'm not going to load you with a lot of data and information, but I'll convey the message in each slide. For example, when you look at in this slide, the heart rate, from the initial, the basal heart rate comes down after six months of practice of yoga. It takes, so it cannot be just five days, six days, one week, two weeks, you'll have the manifestable, uh, manifestable physiological response. You need at least three to four months before you see a physiological manifestation. So we found in six months, significant reduction in the basal heart rate. Similarly, systolic blood pressure come down. But all this within the normal range. As you know, all our physiological functions have a range of normalcy. So instead of being on the top of the curve, you bring to the lower side of the normal range, but you are still normal, but it's not subnormal, normal. And then you have a greater buffer to react during stress. If you are already here, you are going to reach here. But you can, if you are at the bottom of this normal range, then you can you optimize your reaction to stress. So this is what is the message in this slide. Similarly, respiration, the rate comes down and also the depth of ventilation increases. Then when you look at uh, the heart rate variability spectrum, which is a good indicator of your sympathetic parasympathetic balance, you see here the parasympathetic dominance happens after the six months. Uh, this is actually one year after one year of yoga. So there's a shift and uh, the heart rate variability spectrum clearly indicated the buildup of parasympathetic tone. And then we looked at the EEG, the delta, theta, alpha, beta bands, but alpha waves showed a very clear indication of enhancement from here, uh, that is pre-yoga introduction, and then uh, the increase, very significant increase in the alpha index in the people after six months of practice of yoga. And this is one specific slide which indicates, but we also found the theta preponderance in the people, some of them who did uh, yoga for a, uh, the meditation, particularly deep meditation, that you can get theta waves as well, increase in theta waves. Then we were looking at the functional MRI, which indicated two things happen. One is the prefrontal activation, which I have shown here, and also the occipital activation, which is seen here. So these two, because these are the people who meditate with eyes open. So this is Raja Yoga meditation. So I found these people who practice for 20 years. 
So this was the, the I found the prefrontal activation as well as the occipital activation on the right cortex. So I looked at the mechanism. How does it work when you do this yoga? And so this, the, this is the hypothesis which I have given. The sensory inputs from all your musculoskeletal and the receptors, everything goes to the thalamus. And then thalamus in turn feed the, uh, into the brain. Similarly, it is both ways. Yoga directly influences the brain, which you see in the form of EEGs. Then through the limbic connections, through the hypothalamus and through sympathetic and parasympathetic, it brings the autonomic manifestations. Then you have the neurohumeral pathways through hypothalamus, pituitary, gonadal axis or adrenal axis. The hormonal system gets influenced as well. So this is how the yogic practice actually help in bringing those positive benefits which I have shown. Then this is on the heart rate variability spectrum, which I have shown, but I have this one of the quantified uh, slide which I have brought here. Then it also improves the body flexibility. Even if you start yoga at the middle age, I took this population at the age of 45, and you see still the improvement on the shoulder flexion extension, trunk flexion extension, hip flexion extension. So in all these joints, there is a significant increase in the body flexibility. Body becomes very supple, which is very important, which goes down with your aging. So the suppleness of the body is also maintained, even if you start yoga at the middle age. Then I looked at uh, the submaximal level of exercise and maximal level of exercise, which is important for a soldier who has to perform task of that kind demanding task, physically demanding task as well. So I put them on a treadmill and then measured their oxygen consumption, lactic acid, lactic acid thresholds, and also the rate of buildup of lactic acid when they perform a controlled task at submaximal level as well as maximal level. You see, this is the blue graph, uh, is the one which is done after yoga, six months of yoga. The rate of buildup during the exercise, you find there's a rightward shift of the curve. This is control when this is before six months, six months before yoga. And then after this six months practice of yoga, then you see this rightward shift. That means the rate of buildup of lactic acid during the exercise is slower, which in turn has reduces the onset of fatigue. The time of onset of fatigue can be delayed. The lactic acid was one of the important parameter which puts the fatigue to the individual. So you can perform a task without any uh, the fatigue for a longer time, either physical or even mental. So, but the, here it is physical exercise. Whereas on the control group, you see here, there is no difference bit on the right side, this graph. These are the control group and this is the yoga group. So there is no difference, even if after doing six, uh, six months of physical training, because they, are, they continue to do their physical training, which is there in the army as well. So that is the control group and this is the yoga group which performed yoga in place of physical exercise. Then we looked at the biochemical profile, all this instead of looking into the every parameter, the message I want to convey through this slide is, yoga brings a relative hypometabolic state. That means all your parameters, which I showed, comes to the lower side of the normal range. All these are going to be disturbed when you are going to be exposed to stress. So it gives a greater buffer because it comes to the lower side of the normal range and it produces, it conserves energy. The, the message from this is that yoga is conservation. You don't waste. So your energy reserves are more, which could be used during the demand, during either mental exercise, physical exercise, or stressful situation to be coped. So all this, it'll help. So that is the message this slide gives. Then I was looking at uh, the temperate thermoregulatory efficiency. Can it also be influenced by yoga? Because we see yogis living in mountains with minimal clothing, whereas we put three layers, four layers, we still keep shivering. So how is it happening? So is it possible for a common man like us who are not yogis, can we also get some benefits in terms of the improving thermoregulatory efficiency? So I put the soldiers, physical training group, control group, and the yoga training simultaneously at 10 degrees in a cold chamber and without any clothing except shorts on. Then we recorded core temperature, which is oral temperature, 
then uh, mean skin temperature, shivering by integrated EMG, oxygen consumption, cardiovascular response during cold exposure. So what you find here in this slide that the yogic group maintains a higher core temperature as compared to the control group. And this could be achieved by two ways, either by heat conservation or by generating more heat. So I was looking at, I was curious to know, how did these yogis achieve this? Is it by heat conservation or by heat production? So when I looked at the mean skin temperature, the fall in mean skin temperature was almost the same in both control as well as in yoga group. Whereas uh, the other slide shows that the shivering started much later and was of lower intensity in people who practiced yoga. So they achieved this higher core temperature maintenance, not by heat conservation, but by heat production. And that too, not by shivering thermogenesis, but by non-shivering metabolic thermogenesis. This is the hypothesis, cold exposure, and yogic practice through the hypothalamus, it causes this non-shivering thermogenesis enhancement, which is more economical than by producing heat through shivering. Then I looked at the psycho psychophysiological profile, anxiety, depression, concentration, vigilance. The concentration vigilance improves and anxiety and depression scores go down. So there is also a psychological benefit. Then I looked at the uh, whether it can also prevent diabetes. So glucose tolerance test was done on these a large number of people in these uh, uh, the soldiers. Then I was looking at also some of the patients who had diabetes over there. So when I looked at this, you see in this left side graph yoga group, the rise due to the glucose load is minimized and the glucose handling is much faster after six months of yogic practice. So yoga strengthens your carbohydrate handling mechanisms when you give a glucose load, which is seen here. Then I looked at the hypertensives because one of the major causes of death today uh, is the cardiovascular diseases. So in which hypertension is a very important parameter, uh, the cause for death. So when I looked at this, uh, I, we had a hypothesis that in hypertensives, it is the carotid barrow reflex that becomes sluggish. This is like a sentinel keeping watch on your blood pressure variations. So if it blood pressure goes high and then immediately it brings it down because of the sensor, barrow receptor at the carotid sinus. So this becomes sluggish. So can we reactivate through yoga? So I had one control group, 40 patients randomly divided into two groups. One group was put on a table, which is tilted 70 degree head up or 45 degree head down. It's a tilt table in which control group, the patients were kept on this. Then the other group in place of this tilt table exercise, they were given asanas which involve a postural tilt. Like for example, Ardhahalasana, Vipritakarana, Sarvangasana. All this involves a head down tilt Similarly, Ardhahala, uh, Bhujangasana, Dhanurasana, Surya Namaskar, all this involves head up tilt. So I selected asanas, which involves a postural tilt, like a tilt table. So we here is a passive tilt, but there is an active postural change. So that also has the uh, mental and the other psycho benefit, psychological benefit as well. So when I looked at this, this sluggish barrow reflex, you can see it very easily. These hypertensive patients, you put him on a passive tilt on the tilt table, they will go into orthostatic syncope very fast. So they will collapse. So within about, they can't even tolerate more than about 15 minutes of passive tilt. So, uh, so that means there is a sluggish barrel reflex. So after, when you do these exercise, even tilt table exercise, then it, there is an activation of barrel reflex. But then when you do yoga, it's much more than the tilt table. Because in tilt table, what you do, when you do the passive tilt, the muscle pump is released. And then there's a pooling of blood in the lower part of the body. And then venous return to the heart decreases, cardiac output decreases, systolic blood pressure comes down, cerebral perfusion drops, so he goes into syncope. And so this is corrected when you correct the barrow reflex. So when we corrected the barrow reflex, not only this profile of 
tilt gets also, uh, the syncope doesn't occur. Then we looked at the uh, catecholamines, then renin angiotensin mechanism, that all get corrected. So barrow reflex has a unifying role in hypertension, pathophysiology of hypertension. So also in the recovery from hypertension. So this is the uh, hypothesis that when you do yoga, you are reactivating the sluggish carotid sinus barrow receptor, which in turn uh, sends the messages to hypothalamus and the neurotransmitters, catecholamines get reduced, any angiotensin get reduced, and the sympathetic parasympathetic activity balance gets restored. So everything gets restored and blood pressure comes back to normal. So we demonstrated through these experiments, how does yoga brings in hypertensives the blood pressure back to normal. Now the last part of the study on this uh, will be on the coronary heart disease. This was done along with uh, the Mount, Mount Abu. There is a global hospital and this is which is run by the Brahma Kumari Samaj. And we took Raja Yoga as a very important component in coronary artery disease. It was a very large, large number of study. Population is almost about uh, 524 patients of coronary artery disease. At least one vessel, coronary vessel, have 70% blockade as an inclusion criteria. We randomly divided these 524 patients into control who are on conventional medical management for the coronary artery disease. And in the experimental group, we have yoga along with yoga, the lifestyle intervention, and which included low fat, high fiber diet, regular aerobic exercise of walking and Raja Yoga meditation. We were taking care of three important risk factors for coronary artery disease. The first is the sedentary living. So the aerobic exercise of walking takes care of that. Then the uh, dyslipidemia is another important risk factor. So we took care of it through the vegetarian fiber, high fiber diet, low fat, high fiber diet, which is 15 grams is the uh, fat, including the hidden fat. Then the Raja Yoga, the stress is managed by Raja Yoga meditation. So we took these three as a lifestyle intervention. And then we did coronary angiogram. We did a large number of physiological parameters. I'll show some of them. So this is about EEG. It clearly indicates the alpha going up significantly. See this blue, uh, this green, it goes up significantly. And uh, also the, you know, some people have also delta increase. And similarly, lipoprotein and homocysteine levels, you see here lipoprotein level going down. And uh, so this is another very important parameter, which is responsible for the pathophysiology of CAD. Then we were also looking at the, the insulin and leptin. So on this, I'll just give a little glimpse so that I have time for discussion with you. Then again, glucose tolerance we measured in these patients before and after. This was two year follow-up study. It's not just a, a very short study, it's a long follow-up. And then some of the patients were followed for five years. And so this is the uh, parameters of stress hormones, cortisol, catecholamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, the final message is we understood how the how it works, this lifestyle intervention, how does it uh, recover or causes coronary artery disease regression, CAD regression, I'll demonstrate that. Then the pleasant hormones like serotonin, the endorphin going up, you see here endorphin level going up. And melatonin rhythmicity, we looked at the melatonin rhythmicity, 24 hour rhythmicity, you see the amplitude going up early morning, reaching the peak is very high as compared to the blue, the pink one, which you see here. So there was an increased melatonin rhythmicity as well, which was measured in saliva. So then we looked at the coronary angiogram. If you see the control patients who are on conventional medical management for two years follow-up, the if you look at the, uh, the proximal coronary, uh, if you look at this LAD proximal, 52.58% was the blockade. But as the study progressed, we were looking at after two year follow-up with the conventional medical management, it was progression of the disease. 52% blockade becomes 72% uh, blockade. Whereas when you looked at the coronary angiogram of the people who received lifestyle intervention, including Raja Yoga, you find the blockade 
comes from 78.85 to 47. So this is a very clear demonstration of regression. And this was seen by three cardiologists blinded. They didn't know which one was intervention group, which one was control group, and seen the same angiogram seen by three cardiologists with different reports, independent reports. Similarly, another patient, 89.89% blockade. We, brought, we were able to see that after two years, 41%. Because in the literature, if you see, even Dean Ornish showed only arrest of the progression of the disease in that one year. But whereas in our study, we clearly demonstrated regression. And this is the hypothesis we have put. How does it bring this lifestyle intervention? So we looked at the hypothesis. How does these thought processes get uh, transformed into a matter, neuropeptides, and how does it influence the whole cell, uh, the trillions of cells with us? Then we were also looking at other clinical conditions using radiothermogram. And now finally, uh, this is on the some of the negative emotions like anxiety, anger, depression, self-consciousness, all these scores went down. So we were looking at psychological scores. You find the negative emotions going down significantly and the positive emotions like hope, happiness, and quality of life, all this started showing improvement besides the clinical manifestations, the quality of life of these patients improved. Then uh, we also did studies on epilepsy and Sahaj Yoga, Sahaj Yoga, which is another form of yoga, and where we were able to show the duration, intensity, frequency of epileptic seizures was much reduced with Sahaj Yoga practice. And we were also looking at some of the uh, evoke potentials in those people using this meditation. I won't go into the details. Now, finally, the mechanism would be, what are the possible mechanisms? The so first is the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic. By this raising this, you will achieve a balance. So this is one of the mechanism of yoga is yoga builds the parasympathetic tone. So thereby giving a greater buffer and reducing the wear and tear. Instead of your heart pumping 80 beats per minute, if it pumps 60 beats per minute, you see the wear and tear in that system will be much less as compared to your heart pumping at 80, it, it bears out very fast. So this is what is yoga does. It brings all your physiological functions to the lower side of the normal range. It is conservation. Then it also optimizes this sympathetic, uh, parasympathetic balance and gives more stability between the excitatory and the inhibitory or heating and cooling system of your body. Then it also brings tranquility of the mind, which I have shown by EEG, functional MRI, and others. And also it raises the consciousness. In Amity University, we are having programs on the BSc Yoga, which I, I am now the Chancellor of Amity University, and also President for Science, Technology, and Innovation Foundation in Amity. So we have programs like BSc Honors Yoga, MSc Yoga, PhD in Yoga we have started. And also now we are starting a program on uh, the Ayurvedic biology. And not only in one campus, we are doing it. We have 12 universities, 18 campuses abroad. So in all this, we are promoting the Ayush systems. Then we have Amity Institute of Indian Systems of Medicine. Separately, one institute is established in university. And we also have uh, the homeopathy as a part of this. Then we have Ami Herb. We have 15 acres for the herbal medicine cultivation, we have a national medical, uh, the plant board, national medical plant board has given a big program where we have put very important like a podophyllum exandrum, hippopharamnoid, so all that we have put there besides ashwagandha, uh, asimum sanctum and others. Then we have uh, also the Society for Natural Products and Amity Institute for Herbal and Biotech Products, we have another institute here. So we are really focusing uh, tremendously on the Indian systems of medicine in Amity group. Then in, uh, we have a long islands of New York. We have a big campus, uh, 70, 175 acres. And this is the building looks like uh, one of the buildings. There are 11 buildings like this. And in which we have one vertical on traditional systems of medicine, Indian systems of medicine over there. And we are going to start 
a course on Ayurvedic biology over there. International Day of Yoga is being celebrated in that. The final message is, let us take yoga across the cross section of our society, be it school, college, every educational institution, it must become a part of their curriculum. In fact, National Education Policy 2020, uh, which is promulgated uh, very recently, it emphasizes on holistic development and yoga will play a very significant role in this holistic development. Take them to hospitals, to use it as an adjunct therapy, to use it even for the people who, caregivers who come over to the hospitals, the doctors, paramedics and all others, including nurses, they, we should uh, train them on yoga. Yoga incorporates, we should take them to uh, the corporate. The final message is in this International Day of Yoga, which we are going to celebrate in a week from now, that we must, we must practice ourselves. All of us who are proponent of yoga should experience the benefit of yoga. First, practice yoga. Then promote yoga across with your experiential learning and your experimental learning. Take it to the people on a scientific pedestal. So propagate yoga in a big way. And you have enough material, ICT materials, uh, social media, everywhere. Yes, now you have a powerful tool available, social media. Take it to the people, take it to the humanity. And he is the founder president, Dr. Chauhan. I'll conclude with this slide. And uh, so we have now today uh, 12 universities in India, 18 campuses abroad like Dubai, Mauritius, Singapore, London, Romania, China, USA, and China, we don't have operations now. And uh, so we have in 18 campuses. And so uh, we are propagating our system, Indian system all through because he believes when God pushes somebody, inspires somebody, leads somebody, no power in the world can stop such a person. So that is the quote from Dr. Ashok Chauhan. And once again, my best wishes and thank you, Dr. Ananda, Dr. Meena, and all the participants for your patient listening. And I enjoyed presenting it. Now we can chat for a few minutes about what we have discussed so far. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing. Thank, thank you, you so much, sir. That was such an illuminating and a motivating presentation. Uh, looking into the past, the future, the present, and giving us a direction. And I think uh, some of the gems for me were yoga is all about energy conservation. I think that is just such a message. And uh, I thought energy conservation and environmental conservation. I think both are the yoga message, which was so beautiful. And again, to show that hypometabolic uh, physiological mechanisms of yoga. And I think, you know, that concept of samatvam in the Bhagavad Gita goes so much with it. So very illuminating. I uh, open up the floor for uh, questions and discussion for the next uh, 10 minutes. So I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Ingen for some comments on both the talks. Dr. Ingen is a professor of psychology in Norway, in the Institute of Technology there. And uh, thanks to her, we have uh, an MOU with them also. Over to you, Dr. Ingen. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. This was just very two very inspirational talks. Uh, Dr. Hermant Bergrav and Salva Murthy. Professor Salva Murthy, thank you very much very insightful. In the first talk, I took with me that one needs to go to this basic classical uh, scriptures to really understand yoga therapy. I must admit that uh, uh, Dr. Herman's presentations reminded me very much uh, and resembles very much the way that uh, Dr. Gindananda des described how yoga uh, therapy must be built on these uh, classical systems. Otherwise it becomes uh, just treating symptoms. So it must go to these basic questions to understand what is underlying the challenges that people are facing that need yoga therapy. And uh, 
I think uh, for the last speaker, it's such impressive uh, experience that you have both as a yoga practitioner that, that you emphasize yourself and also this rich uh, research experience. You have been a fortunate person who have worked in systems with such resources available that you have used to the best for humanity to enlighten what is possible through yoga. So very inspirational. So I feel that you are really, uh, both of you, uh, examples of the vision for this uh, seminar that uh, how uh, yoga uh, therapy can be achieved in, in healthcare settings, but also in educational settings. So my question would be, because I, I feel a lot of hope after listening to you, but uh, to both of you, what would be the most urgent thing to do to move this uh, science of yoga and promote it further in India and beyond India? Thank you, uh, Ms. Singul Hagen, for this compliments which you have given to both of us. First of all, we are grateful to you for uh, your deep appreciation to the presentations. And Every one of us have a big role to play in propagating this science of yoga. Whether you are a practitioner or you have you are a teacher, in every walk of our life, if you are able to motivate people, inspire people to get into the practice of yoga, and then you can create a new world order. I have a great hope that if you want to create a world, Satyug, where you will see good health for everyone. Everybody is healthy, no hospitals. And everybody is happy, peaceful, harmonious, prosperous. So imagine such a world, yoga can help to achieve that. As if everyone practices yoga and realizes the true existence of yourself, which is Atma, all your problems are solved. So this is what should be the ultimate aim. So that is the long, long, long term goal. But now coming to the short term goal, what do we do? The first thing is here is an international day of yoga opportunity coming up. So wherever you are, whichever organization, whichever institution, whichever country you are, take yoga in that small groups because small drops add to ocean. So if we are able to in our own way, if we are able to propagate and convey the message of yoga, First, you should practice it yourself. So that is important. And you, you should not be only a preacher, but you have to be a practitioner and then preacher as well. So that is the first message I want to convey. Then second is, if you have your own authority in your organization, whatever uh, you have the empowerment, so please use this opportunity to spread this with an objective that you know, to, we want to create that ultimate happy world. So that is the message I want to give. So each one can play their own modest role, which in turn, it becomes multiplied, force multiplier and benefiting the whole humanity. That's how I feel the long term, which is the Satyug, and then the short term, one can do now International Day of Yoga and not only International Day of Yoga, but then you have to continue it throughout the year and uh, keep doing it, keep making efforts and transformation will come. Human mind potentials are so infinite, so powerful. You can achieve anything what you want to achieve if you sincerely wish and work for it. So let's all sincerely wish that we will be able to create Satyug through yoga. Thank you. Thank what you a, very much. What a beautiful Sankalpa. That is a beautiful Sankalpa for a new world order through yoga. Yes. And each drop makes up the ocean. What a beautiful Sankalpa. I request uh, Yoga Charani Deva Sena to express a few thoughts. Namaste Ji. Namaste everyone. Namaste. It's so nice and uh, it's a great satsang actually. So like uh, sitting with Amma Ji Swamiji, it's like uh, having the same feeling and um, 
of course uh, you are crystal clear swastam as we say in sanskrit and uh, how can you sustain just like that sir <laughs> i have learned from you i have learned from people like you <laughs> amma ji swami ji everything for us and uh, of course dr sir dr ananda leading us still to go on even though sometime we get oh <laughs> some discourage like that i'm just uh, your uh, seva is uh, really like uh, having you in our present i mean to be in your presence our uh, great fortune that uh, purva janma i mean uh, all the <laughs> i mean whatever we done little uh, punya that's really very very great and i'm just wondering that you are still i mean with the yogic ing and uh, still that uh, crystal clear that uh, the the koshas really i mean very glorious and uh, just i wonder any time any you had any discourage that uh, we couldn't really make everyone to come and do or we couldn't make anything <laughs> in the yoga field sometime we couldn't bring everyone like that any discourage you had sometime any time thank you thank you uh, devasana ji i still cherish my visit to your your place when uh, our uh, yoga your uh, yoga charini ji uh, bhavani ji was there and then i remember having lunch with all of you in your place just only a cup i think a couple of years ago so thank you so much i i fondly cherish reminiscence the memories of my visit to Gita and Ashram, as well as to your home. Thank you so much for this wonderful remarks. Thank you. I still remember the song, Ji. Ah, oh. <laughs> we used to sing and. Aru pade deedu konda, deedu muruga. Deedu muruga, yes, sir. So nice, and uh, we are wondering that uh, any uh, special thing you want to share with Abdul Abdul Kalam Ji. You used to talk with him or sing. anything you want to share the uh, very special yeah. moments anything actually abdul kalam you know you uh, some of you all of you may be knowing he was our former president of india and uh, also he was a bharat ratna and he was a great scientist of defense he was also known as father of missile technology here in india so many many more above all a good human being good human being who always thought of uh, humanity what one can do and so i was fortunate i was blessed to be a friend of dr kalam he used to always refer me as a friend even though i he was my boss uh, in drdu then as president i have been also advising him in many issues but i had the opportunity of knowing him learning him by being some of the best qualities he had you know being humble simple he was a practitioner of yoga he used to practice pranayama and he used to do asanas he used to pray veena so uh, what i want to say is you a human being you have to he can also shake hands with uh, bill clinton as a president he can also go to a cook in the kitchen and say we were we were sambar was fantastic so you see that is the simplicity and the seamless everyone is a human being that president has a role and this cook has a role equally important in the society so this realization will come when you practice yoga so samarsva yoga uchyate you there is equanimity will come we are all soul atma in different roles that is all president role is one role cook role is another role but equally important this is what is the realization yoga will bring and uh, so that is what we should see we should be a good human being yoga helps you to be a good human being because human atma is pure powerful blissful and also it is it is uh, it has everything what you want at bharpur you know you don't need anything out from outside everything is in you yoga helps you to look inwards and then search on the treasure within you you don't have to look for any treasure outside happiness or fame name and appreciation everything is inside once you go inside everything is the treasure house yoga helps you to do that atma is bharpur is full you don't need anything else so this is this realization will come this is what i found when i interacted with dr kalam he was that full man complete man thank you thank you jeev your blessings 
and of course seeing you are like a uh, you are like your atmas remembers like a purushottama seeing like a purushottama being in the purushottama's presence thank you thank you so much for your blessings ji thank you thank you thank you, so, sir. Thank you very much uh, balaji uh, yes. ananda continue yes. this mission and god bless you and your family and your mission yes, and whatever little i can do anytime please feel free to do that i'll be part of your mission Definitely, thank you thank you so much to each and every one of you who have joined us on this thank you i request meena to give the concluding aspects sir i i don't know i have no words to say what it was hearing your experiential journey how you devised you know research is just one part of what it is but uh, what you spoke now what you uh, presented now how you devised a study and then how you took it uh, one step ahead one step ahead one step ahead uh, we all have to you know learn so much and uh, that is where this whole journey you as the leader leading the pathway and uh, you know again um, it's real established you know like uh, the greater you become the down to earth and simpler you are so thank you sir you thank have you. truly truly showed us that again reaffirming what we need to be to look inside and how to make all these practices or all these as an experience so that we can start looking inward and not go outward searching for all this so you being the leader guiding us leading the pathway we all are just following you sir uh, you are there so we have that uh, you know mental satisfaction that yes we can reach you we can uh, you know catch up with you very maybe it may take lifetimes but we will catch up with you sir thank you so much uh for your wonderful uh, insightful presentation thank, thank you. you thank sir. you thank you dr meena and also let us all join hands to create a happy world let us first be happy yourself and radiate that happiness around let's create a happy world with that message thank you so much thank you sir so let me just share the screen so that i can so we have as as you know uh, the sbv yoga mahotsav 2023 in commemoration of the international day of yoga uh, this year we have uh, we from uh, the school of yoga therapy of iscm uh, have you know like uh, done it as a one month long celebration starting with the international faculty development program which started may 23rd and we also had uh, the sbv yoga fest uh, with a regional yogasana competition and uh, quiz online yoga quiz competition as well as the yoga essay competitions which is all uh, you know like it's all over and uh, upcoming um, conference the national conference which is tomorrow and the day after tomorrow the 16th and the 17th of uh, june Uh, we also have a, a mass yoga demonstration uh, by the students of sbv uh, at the promenad beach uh, which is like near the gandhi tidal uh, one of the prime areas so uh, with all this the yoga day uh, is going to be a grand grand celebration from shri balaji vidyapeet uh, the ninth one in a row uh, starting from 2015 the ninth one in a row thanking each and every one of you who has been a part of this with us in this journey and uh, on behalf of the school of yoga therapy uh, on behalf of the iscm the institute of salutogenesis and complementary medicine of shri balaji vidyapeet we are so grateful to you for your support and uh, you know hoping to interact with all of you in the near future uh, again reminding you that we have the paper presentations uh, which is a part of the national conference uh, so please participate in that and uh, let's let's hope that we will meet you all tomorrow 
uh, with our in the national conference. So thank you. Uh, we'll finish up with the Shanti Mantra. Duka Samastha Sukhino Havantu Sarve Janaha Sukhino Havantu Om Shantihi 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 Thank you all and see you soon. Take care and bye.